Ten years ago, I got a call offering me the opportunity to host a new engineering game show for Channel 4. Sounds like fun, I thought, and I was right. We shot a series and it was fun. And then I thought, no, it'll never catch on. It's like a dreamland, but it's real. It's euphoria to get in there. It's a great place to be. It's men being allowed to do what they should have learned not to do when they were 16. There's definitely a sense of anarchy to Scrap Heap Challenge. It's destroying things, isn't it? Another one of life's luxuries. You spend a whole day making it, and the next day trying to destroy it. How much better can he have than that? It's been a wild and crazy ride through ten amazing years. But just as with all the most riveting stories, it's best to start right back at the beginning. The seed for a decade of mechanical madness was sown in 1997 when a young TV researcher called Kathy Rogers was inspired by a scene from the Hollywood blockbuster Apollo 13. The astronauts are going to die unless they can fix their carbon monoxide filter, but they don't have the right parts. So the boys back at Mission Control gather up all the same bits and pieces that the astronauts have on board and work out how to save their lives. And we just thought there's something really interesting about that idea that from a load of inanimate objects you can make something which is then not only going to function but be able to save someone's life. So the brainstorming sessions began. The idea being a TV show that recreated famous historical crises that had ingenious solutions. But it wasn't quite gelling. And then someone says, well, you know, if you think about where is, where is there just loads of rubbish to build things from other than a rubbish bin? And someone suggested a scrap heap. And so we shot the pilot. Welcome to Scrap Heap, the ultimate in recycling. It's the show where two teams battle out to build something spectacular out of the parts that nobody else wants. So we said we're going to give them a day, we're going to give them a scrap heap, and we'll set them to work. Good luck, teams. Your time starts now! <laughs> With the lovely Sally Gray presenting and two teams of five competing, the first ever scrap heap build started somewhat slowly. Let's get the scavengers out to find things, because if we don't get our scavengers out to find things, the other team find them first. Snackered. The problem was that because we'd never done anything like it before and nobody else had really ever done anything like it before, we had very little idea about what is involved in making a functioning machine out of... I mean, out of anything, even out of good parts, let alone out of junk parts. Oh, oh! Oh, no! Oh, please! The pilot was perilously close to never, ever getting finished. I mean, even in terms of filming it, because at the end of the day, we had one completely non-functional hovercraft... Tragedy! ..and one hovercraft that could probably be described as about 12% functional. <laughs> Which wasn't exactly, a, you know, a great card to go to Channel 4 and say, look, we've cracked it. But at the point that one of the hovercraft just about managed the tiniest little poof of a hover, we kind of thought, there's hope here. You know, we can, we can finesse this and we can make it work. Thankfully, Channel 4 agreed and commissioned a six-episode series. And while Sally had done a great job, they wanted the show to have a host without that certain something. We didn't want to have anyone who was already a presenter, so we made ourselves a, a slightly difficult job there. And instead, we thought, we've got to think laterally. We've got to think of someone who maybe is in the kind of drama show that might have an interest in engineering or in science in some way. Could you be talking about me? I mean, it was just one of those brilliant things as soon as Robert walked in. It was just so obvious that he was the guy. I couldn't tell them about the conga reels. I mean, the mouth and the big hang, hang. <laughs> if I say schoolboy excitement and Robert Llewellyn, I think those two, those two phrases are pretty compatible. I got the job. 
Now I needed somewhere to call home, so the very first scrap heap set was built in West London. Two resident teams would compete each week, one of which was led by a certain mustachioed military man. I'm Dick. I'm a major in the army. I invent things in my spare time, and the yellow team don't like coming second. I don't think anybody really knew what was going to happen in the first series, and so starting work at 6.30 in the morning and then working through to 3 the following morning, was well, so that's 21 hours straight. It was a phenomenal day. We were all really still flying by the seat of our pants, and, you know, every day we didn't know quite what was going to appear, and health and safety was still a kind of distant, <laughs> a distant concept. Hit it. The sun has set. Time has elapsed. Oh, God. That's all right, isn't it? Woo! Yeah, kick Gentlemen, it. warm up your engines! Of all the machines the teams built in that first year, it was these mechanical tugs of war that were the most thrilling to see in action. In the very first series, we competed after we finished our build, and that race was in pitch black with lights all around to sort of uh, illuminate it. It seemed to go on and on and on and on, with the revs getting higher and higher and the smoke getting more and more. And you just thought the only way this can end is in disaster. The smoke, the flames, everything, it was scary. So the die of TV mayhem had been cast, and the show was already becoming a firm family favourite. But that was just the start of the adventure. When it was shown in 1998, the first series went down well and a second series was commissioned. But the problem was, I made the show seem far too masculine. So a search party was sent out to find me a female sidekick. So we started looking for, for women who had an interest in engineering and the tumbleweed <laughs> passed in front of our eyes lots of times. And we did find quite a lot of people who we quite liked, but we kept going to Channel 4 and they were like, oh, no, this isn't quite right for this reason or that reason. And then eventually they said, well, you are interested in engineering and you can talk, so why don't you do it? This week's teams have got to do what man's been doing for 4,000 years. Think wind power. They've just got to build a yacht. Careful of that Careful joystick. Of that. So it was goodbye to single screen life for me. Well, are you having lessons? <laughs> I am, I think I've got the knack of it. And it was also goodbye to our two resident teams. So for series two, we really opened it up. I mean, the one thing was that we wanted to make it much more competitive. So we thought we'll have new teams every week and whoever wins will go on to the next round and whoever loses is basically, you know, on the next train back home. So the country was scoured and eight teams were selected to fight it out for the Scrap Heap Challenge Trophy. For these fans of the new show, it was an exciting adventure. The first time I saw Scrap Heap, which is the very first series, I thought, wow, really want to, you know, have a crack at that. Running speed, Mr Christian! The megalomaniacs, I think, were the ones who ultimately won that series and they were... Well, every show they did was memorable in some way. I mean, Nosha is a larger-than-life character anyway. It's actually the first Brilliant. time I've seen a land yacht with a figurehead. <laughs> <laughs> At least we picked a pretty one. <laughs> the very first time they were on the show, they were building land yachts, and they managed to set fire to their entire sail. Whoa! Oh, come on! Your heart really goes out to them, but the producer in you is like, yes, that was fantastic. Bit of a setback, but there you go. But their best machine was their walking machine. On your marks, get set, go! The most bizarre contraption you've ever seen in your life, but it did actually walk. They're galloping forward! <laughs> They've moved forward about uh, two feet. The megalomaniacs had this kind of bonkers jumping hair, which basically shook itself apart. It almost looks like one's going forwards and one's going backwards. It's very ugly. And in, in the end, I mean, we'd literally only got a couple of yards to go. But just said, Kev, just floor it. <laughs> and it, it got across the line. Yes! It had been a triumphant final with the Megalomaniacs crowned series champions. And confidence in the programme was growing. 
When series two went out, I think that was the first time when we thought we've kind of got the show right now. People get it, people watch it. We don't spend all our time on the phone having to explain what it is anymore because it's kind of out there. People, you know, people were starting to say, oh yeah, that, that funny show, that scrap heap show where they build amazing machines. Mama crews are ready. So now with the wind under our scrap wings. Oh, look at that. The third series of scrap heap challenge was a riot of insane invention. With teams building everything from brick munching monsters oh to miniature submarines. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you die. Uh, dive, dive. I meant dive, sorry. <laughs> it all came to a climax when the Strawbridge Brothers in Arms team took on Nosh's megalomaniacs in the grand final. We built what I thought was a really powerful, very capable dragster. Sadly, at the start line for the very first event, head to head, we had a problem with our gearbox. And I think I am the only person who's actually reversed up a drag track. Yeah! So, Nosh's megalomaniacs were Scrap Heap's first grand champions. But by now, it wasn't just British audiences tuning into Scrap Heap. The show had become a cult hit in the USA. So, they asked us to make an American version. There was this quite complicated year when we were going to be making shows for the States and we were going to be making shows for England, but we only had one production team. And so we just thought, well, they have more summer in America, so we need to go there to shoot the whole thing. The Southern Californian desert became our new home. It was hot as hell, but the fantastic terrain allowed us to try some exciting and not always entirely successful new challenges. But there was one team that year for whom failure simply wasn't an option. Stop chatting and get on with doing something. Tell me you can hear me, team. Get somewhere, get off the buggy, and then so we yeah. can talk properly. OK. The Catalysts were a, a, a memorable team because they were very different from our normal teams. We planned everything. We, th we thought really hard about how to win, because we really wanted to win. We're going to have a team five minutes now. They were representing Jaguar cars, and they obviously took that you know, that, that representation very, very seriously. I think we might look at a redeployment of some labour here to match the skills that are required at this point. Their because... captain was terrifyingly bossy. Yep. Any questions between now and victory? No. No? Yeah. OK. Right, right off you go, <laughs> kids. Let's go. Three, two, one... It was this almost professional approach that meant the Catalyst vanquished all before them to become series champions. <laughs> Teams, your challenge today is a duel on wheels. So it was to a grand final against Nosha's megalomaniacs and a very special challenge. Yes, teams, I command stun to you to build the most powerful, vicious, agile fighting car the Heap has car. ever seen. Oh, cool, baby. Now, sadly, although we'd like to see you kill each other, the judges have decreed that the vehicles must be remote controlled. What? So the All kids love remote control cars. We got to build big ones. <laughs> <laughs> the megalomaniacs may have had plenty of grunt, but the catalysts were more calculating. Got a ratio of 3.4. I think the catalysts seem to have done a lot more forward planning. There's a lot of catalysts. Well, you can see there's a piece of paper on the floor yeah. there with high level maths. Yeah. See, that's the trouble. I would have been at the back of class sniggering and not concentrating <laughs> on my maths. And they were at the front listening. That's the difference between me and the catalysts. <laughs> The Californian desert was to be the scene yeah. of an epic battle that would go down in Scrap Heap history as not just one of the most brutal, but also the most controversial. We just absolutely annihilated the other car. Absolutely annihilated it. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. And we were knocking seven bells out of them. <laughs> oh, no! Hey, hey, hey. 
the catalysts were getting caned. That was brutal. Have we scored any points at all yet in this entire competition? But they knew how to exploit the rule that stated mere contact with the opponent's scoring target would earn points. Their train is actually touching the 100 point mark. So I think that's two hits, so I think they're ahead. Well, then, on a technicality, because a little chain was dangled on the roof, um, we uh, lost. The Maniacs, final, oh, 520, but the Catalyst final, 620! Yes! Yes! Got us the most negative feedback from the public. We got emails saying how it was a fix and terrible. Because to them, it looked like we were just sort of playing with them, and these weren't real point scoring. But they were the, they were the rules we were winning by. And uh, we weren't very popular for winning that one. So the Sly Cats reigned supreme and the fourth series was over. Of course, we'd also made the US version of the show, Junkyard Wars. And before we came back home to the UK, my American counterparts and I presented a show that broke the scrap heap mold. As you may recall, it's been 100 years since Wilbur and Orville Wright made their first epic flight at Kitty Hawk. Well, today, we're turning back the clock to the 1900s. Your As show. the series went on, Scrap Heap did gain in confidence, and we decided that we could take on some bigger subjects. And also, we liked the idea of having three teams sometimes and making the competitions international. Your challenge is to build and fly an aircraft from that time, but only using period junk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Set this tough task, our teams built three great planes. Crazy enough, but things were about to get a lot crazier. A 1910 airplane. On test day, each plane was to run up to takeoff speed to check for stability. What we hadn't bargained for was the sheer exuberance of maverick British pilot Billy Brooks. Okay, let's go! He was meant to be going up for a little test flight, just, you know, let's play things very, very safely. And he just was in this machine that he'd built, and he was obviously just in heaven, and he couldn't stop. And in a way, you completely empathised with him. You know, who would have wanted to stop and come down? More speed. He's got it. That is amazing. <laughs> it's just up. It's just flying. I mean, this is one heck of a test flight. I had a suspicion once he got in the air, that guy's not going to come ah. down for a while. So the American adventure had taken off. But tired of always being in my shadow, and now far too busy, Cathy went back to full-time producing. But my newfound freedom wasn't to last. In no time at all, a pretty young petrol-headed starlet was found and was gently persuaded to be my new scrap buddy. As soon as we met Lisa, and as soon as Lisa and Robert met each other and instantly had a rapport and a stupid sense of humour in common, we knew that it was going to work. Or shall I see you again? Yes, of course. I wandered lonely as a cloud. You know, Robert and I hate each other, really, but we put a good act on. Daddy! My daddy! I mean, Robert and I do genuinely get on very well. I absolutely love the bloke to bits. They tried so hard. Oh, should we take them a nice cup of tea and a homemade macaroon? They do get some macaroons. Oh. Along with Lisa, I had a new heap to call home in leafy Berkshire. <laughs> and it was here that we first heard the now familiar song of a decidedly daft farmer from Devon. Proper job! Proper job! Proper job! Proper job! Proper job! Everybody say it is a catchphrase and cool, look, there's old proper job back again, like, but did not really, it is sort of something that we'd chuck in amongst conversation all the time down our end. The proper proper job. job! But there was more to Andy Barnes and the barley pickers than just a catchphrase. Are you ready? Yes! From the moment their magnificent mud monster ploughed its way onto the podium, <laughs> to when their battering boat won them the series final, the farmers were on fire. And so they faced the reigning grand champions in what was to become Scrap Heap's definitive calamity. Catalysts, barley pickers, kiss goodbye to common sense. Reach for those smelling salts, because we want you to build a gargantuan, gravity-defying, car-flinging machine! Yeah! yeah! Oh, ho, ho. And I just couldn't believe what we was asked to do. My plan, should you choose to accept it, 
is to build something called a trebuchet. Oh, right. It's a type of. Oh, that's a posh word before we start. But we thought that's going to be the biggest, funniest thing we've ever come across in our life. What we're going to specialise in is using a big ramp and a bit of elastic. The idea of launching a car was just fantastic. You, you couldn't pay to have that much fun. Let's okay, go. ready? Let's go! 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 go, go. If the team was going to got it straight away and I think realised how completely crazy it was. And the sh machines they built <laughs> fitted in with that craziness. And we're off. The Crafty Cats built a big, slick rail car launcher. Lovely. But it was dwarfed by the barley picker's absolutely titanic trebuchet. Beautiful! We saw these things go up onto the runway. And, I mean, the car flingers from the catalyst was pretty impressive. We were running around doing our checklist as usual, but out of the corner of our eye, we could see this huge device emerging. We can see this enormous skip. And I remember the expert saying, oh, go on, yeah, load some more ballast in, load some more ballast in. Can't have too much, can't have too much. And they had this massive skip, and they were filling it with lead. It's a huge weight yes. in that skip, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you were standing underneath it <laughs> and it dropped, I don't think we You'd would see flat. it. You'd, You'd be, be very, very flat. flat. Yeah. We were going to chuck that mini a mental distance. It's going to be a heck of a waste. You know, we was going to chuck into the next county near enough. It was bound to beat the catalysts. And we knew when we sat out on the runway that if their machine had worked, they should have won. But what happened is what happened. OK, barley pickers, you are free to fling to victory. Well, hey! <laughs> <laughs> but that was awesome. I reckon it was absolutely marvellous, funny as blazes. It could have been no better. Rather more successful was the Catalyst's launcher, providing an impressive finale. But the day's abiding image is that truly magnificent balletic meltdown. After that catastrophic failure, the catalyst still reigned supreme. But it wasn't all over for the barley pickers. It was time for Scrappy to go on holiday with what else but a road trip. Scrappy races is like all the wildness of Scrappy Challenge tenfold. Scrappy races were a um, kind of spin-off, I suppose, of Scrappy Challenge. But we thought we'd get five uh, teams who would prove themselves. That ain't what you would call a proper job, is it, boys? They'd have one vehicle each, which they could adapt and build, and then drive round the country to different locations, changing and adapting that vehicle to whatever the challenge was that week. These hurried rebuilds were always eventful, never less so than when the teams pitched up in South Wales. The challenge was to build a flat-out speed machine to scorch up the famous Pendine Sands. We were sat in this scrapyard out in Pendine, and we were commissioned to make this lorry go faster because we could only get 50 out of it. So we thought, we need to do better than that. So I'm there looking at the tachometer, and he's going up to 1,500 revs. I'm looking at that like, whoa! My tractor revs faster than that. When he, when he revs up, he won't kick back on us, so he'll go on further. There's a little screw on the fuel pump. If you unscrew that one there, about half a turn, that'll make a big difference to the fuel If you can get that to 65 mile an hour without popping them, Barnsley, I reckon that's good. All if, right. you, if you can, you're better off leaving it alone. It'll be all right, trust me. Yeah, it's all right, yeah. it's not a problem. Andy has actually gone a step too far now. He's started to pull the injector from the part, and... Because they're quite complicated bits of kit. Yeah, it's a very complicated piece of kit, right. and Andy's not a very complicated type of kit person. <laughs> so that was marvellous job, until the nut came off in me hand. What have you done, Andy? Thanks, <laughs> Andy. Andy. You've never seen anyone like it in all your born days. There were people running in all directions away. <laughs> <laughs> You'd never believe it. And there, look, a closer inspection here. confirmed the barley's look, worst fears. Rod. What's happening down there? The followers popped out down the bottom off the camshaft. I was mortified because you spent all this time building it and 
it's the first challenging you've got and destroyed your engine. What are the chances of it being mended today? Zero. There you are. Yeah, I was in the doghouse for quite a little while after that. I don't mind telling you. Thankfully, the barley pickers switched their engine and were back on, or should I say, off the road in no time. Look at that. Not a problem at all. Effortlessly. Brilliant. Brilliant. What a run. Scrappy Races was all about adaptability, driving ability and taking the odd chance. Something rally driver Nicky Woolmore took to like a duck to water. Going round there, I just thought, well, the engine's in the back, that means I could ram the front. I just went for it. She is going quick. Come on, girls, just make it to the end. Then we did have a slight accident. I kind of went a bit off course in the water and got stuck. I think they need a tow. I think they might need a tow. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, this wasn't Nicky's only mishap at the wheel during scrappy races. I might have had a slight accident in the Capri. <laughs> That's reverse. Yeah, I did sort of go into a bit of a bush ditch um, and got a lot of stick for it sort of on the bar in the evening <laughs> he's been on my back all day i've had a belly full hang on of course it's not always just the machines that get treated less than sympathetically on scrappy Gemma, why are you still doing nothing i mean that's i'm ridiculous. waiting just with no, no point in waiting get on with the hey, job hey 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 just calm well, down not the time I'm about to have a sense of humour failure. Gemma from the Marshall Mechanics there. Certainly no shrinking violet. But the fellas like a good row too. Just try adding a stubborn captain to a strong-minded expert. Come on, get your hands out of your pocket! Christ's sake! Put the original keyboard from the original twist grip from there onto there. That's exactly what I said right at the start. Only I said about using that cable and that cable. I don't care what, which cable you use. The thing about scrap heap is because teams are put under pressure, it's not long before their real personalities come out and you have genuine rows. Come on, lads. You want me to build this boat myself? Can't even get this, yeah. get this thing off the ground. That's the problem. Is it, we, man, Mr. It weighs so engine. damn much. I just give up with you. I'll give up with you. We all love a good argument. Steve's and I done. think that, you know, the, the axis of argument, particularly with teams that have won a few times, is nearly always between the captain and the expert. Because the expert is obviously thinking, I'm an expert. You know, I know about these machines. You've got to listen to me. You're the captain. You are the team. You're supposed to be doing the work, I'm supposed to be advising you. We cannot yeah. physically manipulate that device. But the engine isn't stopping the paddles being made. The two people who could work on the paddles and the stern were out trying to get that engine moved in here. And the captain thinks, well, I'm the captain. We've won lots of these competitions, so I know how we're meant to go about doing these things. I'm severely concerned that that engine is an anchor for us in more ways than one. I can have that engine mounted in an hour. All right, you do that. We'll get but the you said that five hours ago. ago. Yeah. <laughs> With sparks flying in the build bay, it's just as well I have an oasis of calm knowledge on tap. A figure that is beyond criticism, that oozes authority. I am, of course, referring to the judge. Our mechanical magistrates have come in many guises, but they are always at the very top of their game. Not least this world land speed record holding knight of the realm. Well, when you come on to Scrappy Challenge as a judge, um, it's a very interesting situation because uh, you've got to give some sort of view as to, you know, which team is actually going to do the better. And it's actually hell's difficult. So who is your money really on now, then? Well, I, I'm still desperately undecided, you know, Rob. Of course I mean, you want to roll your sleeves up and get in. You really want to do. And, of course, it can be very frustrating because you can think that, you you know, that, hey, they're doing that wrong and they should have done this and so on. If, if you had to choose one of these teams to be on, on one of your engineering projects... Um, I, I'd probably choose neither. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here we are, Richard, with this enormous strip of tarmac, looking, <laughs> looking rather, and it's rather dominating this very small vehicle just sitting quietly there. But I've got a feeling it could get a bit noisy. It's going to get a hell's noisy. <laughs> Braving the unknown is all part of the job for a judge, but the reward is sights such as jet-powered cars tearing up a drag track and the tension of true competition. Oh, amazing. 
the Ginganguli's first run time is 38.19 seconds. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One second in it, I told you. It was just a laugh from start to finish. Great fun and uh, great, great company. By now, Scrappy was eight years old, and for obvious reasons, it was time to put a roof over our heads. We found a new heap of scrap to plunder with two cosy new build bays to play in. And it was here that we met three very focused gents from Kent. We, we really want to be starting something here, fellas. Yeah, We've never well, actually jacked so far. We just looked at this mail bike. Yeah, I have a very soft spot for the power lifters, but they definitely had a dark side and a soft side. You know, Dave. Yeah. Batter it in with Emma. I wouldn't ask too many questions about what he did on the weekend, I don't think. And Neil, who was a power lifters captain, why are we worried about one inch? Really wanted to win, you know, very organised, extremely good engineers. It was this fiery focus that drove the powerlifters from building an underwater car in their first round... Yes! ..to an ice-shredding motorised pinball puck in the second. <laughs> their drag truck crashed through the gears to set up a rock-crawling challenge series final against the Beasts of Bodmin. Well, we got the front wheels up, lads. Driving around the, the course wasn't too bad until we got to the, the, the final hill. Um, it was like 45 degrees or something, and uh, the boulders were just huge, and everything was... It was so hot down there, it was incredibly hot. Where are we going? Their opponents had gone well without quite crossing the line. For a while, it seemed the powerlifters would suffer the same fate. We got to the very top, and I must admit, I didn't think it was going to go over. It's amazing that it's got up that far. <laughs> Mark just let it cool down for a minute, let the gearbox get some strength, fires it back up again, and then just uh, kept wobbling the steering, and luck would have it, the steer joint caught one of the rocks, and away we went. There we go, there we go. <laughs> You're over the line, bruv. <laughs> I felt personally responsible for getting, getting the team through to the final, and, of course, once we'd won it, I could, uh, all my emotions let go, and I was uh, able to have a little grizzle. Well done for the powerlifters. Fantastic. Yay! It's <laughs> lovely seeing the other side of, of blokes' personality, well, anybody's personality, but particularly men who you think are going to be real tough nuts. And uh, you realise how much it actually matters to teams to win Scrap Heap, when all they're winning is the honour of winning Scrap Heap. There's no money involved. And I pulled in my heartstrings. It was lovely. That emotional rock crawling celebration wasn't the end for the powerlifters. Come on, powerlifters! Come on, powerlifters! They Come were to triumph lifters. in the grand final, but not stop, before their stop, bodged up stop. kite took out a piece of our costly oh, kit. Look out, cameraman! It's the last thing anybody wants, but the spectre of mishap looms over each and every scrap heap challenge. But let's face it, they're the best bits. Embarrassments are all very amusing, but it's test day with all its high emotions and dented pride that I've learned to love best. But I was slightly oh. nervous then because he was actually yeah. heading towards yeah, us. Yeah, I was <laughs> planning to abandon this trip. Yes. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. What happened? There's there's a It's catastrophic. Oh, no. That's gone now That's disastrously well. Yeah. That was a good save. That wasn't quite what we expected. Oh, what's that? Oh, 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 my goodness. <laughs> Just go for it, my dad. Look what's happened. Don't let go of it, hard. Man, what about me? Got a drive problem. Oh, there it goes. That's the radiator gone. Fire balloon attacks. Fire! 
<laughs> it was nice. A brave attempt. A brave a attempt, brave yeah. attempt. Whether a fabulous failure or a soar-away success, Scrap Heap test days have always been the climax of the shows, which is why we found a way to do it all day long with as many people as possible on our Scrap Heap Challenge road shows. <laughs> A Scrappy Challenge Road Show, the atmosphere is absolutely amazing. King Size Coopers have taken it! I think the Scrappy Road Show gives the chance for viewers at home to become involved in Scrappy in a far more immediate way. <laughs> So you can just come along on a day, having built your machine at home, and, and test it against other Scrap Heap fans. The public enter road shows not just to beat each other, but to get the chance to take on an elite invitation team of Scrap Supremos. All Stars, you have been selected to represent the honour of the Scrap Heap because of three vital ingredients. You're very skillful, you're very ingenious, but above all, you are very cheap. <laughs> That's a bit right. <laughs> <laughs> Even when they're allowed the traditional 10 hours, the all-star build is not always the creative hothouse one might imagine. Go ahead, tell us what you find. Andy, we're not listening to you. You gotta listen to me. Take your piano and take it somewhere else. <laughs> Every single road show you do, you make something in the heat, think this is all right, this is gonna do the job. Where's your steering wheel? How's that? <laughs> you turn up at the road show and you look at what they actually made in their back sheds, and it's phenomenal. You gotta take your hat off to every one of them. Do you think you're gonna beat the All-Stars again? We're gonna wipe the floor with them. <laughs> that's what I like to do. I reckon out of all the uh, road shows I've done, the Sofa Speedway had to be the most edgiest seat, exciting one I think I've ever done. We challenge teams from all over the country to build pieces of motorised furniture to race around our treacherous track. Oh, oh we had a spill of the black. Oh, oh what a shame. shame. He was going so well. In the final race, all comer champs, the king-sized Coopers, took on the All-Stars for the big showdown. Oh, it's oh, ugly there. Oh, oh, don't the road there. It's a little rude, I think. They produced the day's most dramatic race. Ooh, that's not good. Tom was steering and had the throttle. And then I had all the levers to pull to try and make the gearbox, the clutch and the brakes work. And he was just there making noise. I could almost see me life flashing in front of me. With eight epic series of Scrap Heap already under our tool belts, we thought we'd already seen the best machines and the most inspired teams, which makes it all the more remarkable that the best was still to come. Not least in our epic head-to-head -head human powered train race, where our teams were challenged to put their muscles on the line. Okay, Richard, throw the signal. Go, go, go! One team built a, a kind of a hamster wheel that they were going to drive on the tracks and the other team with pedal power so you had four blokes lined up on, on bikes. It is absolutely neck and neck. It's nothing, isn't it? When are they over? Now. Well done. It was really, really hard work, but it did just look utterly hilarious. Oh, God. I think one chap had an asthma attack at the end. <laughs> It was another physical challenge, manoeuvring mechanical mortars, that almost sent a team of dog-handling policemen back home to Newcastle after the first round. Yes! This is so close. At the moment, I'm not even sure who's in the lead. Do you know what? It's all going to come down to this run. It was the final sprint to the finish and the three bonus points that would decide the winner. And with that slow start, the Wolves needed a miracle. After taking advantage of such bad luck, surely the policemen were full of remorse. I mean, I felt awful about it for a, probably thousandths of a second, but he <laughs> ran away past them. 
and then obviously we got to the end. <laughs> that was fantastic. In the semi-final, their fast and frightening drag sled produced another moment of heart-stopping drama on its way to winning them a place in the final. <laughs> so Woof Justice had won the chance to challenge Torquay's beach bums for the right to take home the Scrap Heap trophy. You must build high-speed Swamp races. <laughs> I thought the drag sleds was dangerous enough, but this thing up. Uh... Right, does anybody know anything about uh, swamp races? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was the mother of all builds, with heavy metal being winched and bent left, right and centre. But both the beach bums and hard-working Woof Justice produced magnificent machines that found a fitting test location at a grand stately home. Basically in the pond of this stately home with this beautiful clay-lined pond and Scrap Heap Challenge come down and ripped the place apart. It looked absolutely brilliant. Come on! Come on, Andy, come on, son. Look at him go, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. straight in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what a splash! Keep going, where are you going? Water going everywhere, mud everywhere, but both machines work. When the run started, and I could see this thing, and you could hear it because it had no exhaust on, oh, it sounded beautiful. Get out there! Get out there! And then as soon as it hit the water, it just went quiet. And my initial thought was, that's it. We failed. The Jag's really struggling. It's still it's going. It's still going. But... It's still going. <laughs> but actual fact, it was just the water making the whole thing quiet. The back wheels are completely under the water. Yeah, but, but they're, they're still, still testing they're still well. for us because there's just no resistance. Oh, yeah! I had absolutely no idea who was going to win that. And obviously, it was really, really close. <laughs> so go on, Bobby, put us out of our misery. The winners of Scrap Heap Challenge 2006 are... Wolf Justice! Yes! 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 <laughs> So Woof Justice had prevailed and were through to challenge reigning scrap heap champions, the powerlifters. In a furious frenzy of destruction, the Tynesiders barged the Kent bikers into the dirt, becoming undisputed grand champions. It didn't seem possible, but in the tenth and most recent series of Scrap Heap Challenge, we've carried on reinventing the wheel doing incredible deeds for the first time and in the fastest time. We got a flying start, smashing the scrap heap speed record at Pendine Sands. Oh, brilliant! That's a new record! Fantastic! That is Yay. amazing. After the car-flinging fiasco, we tried again, albeit with a 50cc scooter. <laughs> but it didn't half go. <laughs> We dared to dream challenging teams to build superbikes and had a proper Moto Grand Prix, crashes and all. <laughs> For years, it was the impossible dream, but yes, we even had a speedboat that actually sped. But that is what we've been wanting on Scrap Heap for 10 years, a boat that goes fast. We witnessed the holy grail of jet propulsion when a fire-breathing afterburner blasted a rail sled down our test track. And to top it off, the granddaddy of all towaways, our teams hitched up a 100-ton jumbo jet and tugged it down an airstrip. What a decade it's been. So many thrills and spills, with adrenaline highs and gut-wrenching lows, and that's just what you've seen on the screen. Behind the scenes, there are dozens of production staff who work all hours and in all conditions. But for me, the real delight has been witnessing what the brilliant, bodging public can do when they put their minds to it and what it means to them. 
when they rise to the scrap heap challenge. Going back on the scrap heap is just like being a big child again. It's the hardest work I've done in years, but I loved every second of it. The people go up to this. Oh, you lost off scrap heap. They say, like, oh, you must get bored of talking about it. No. I loved doing every single one. <laughs> It's that elation, oh my God, what have I done? We've built this thing out of junk, and it's done this fantastic thing. Yes. Right, there he goes. Yes, yes. 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 wonderful. Yes. So that was a decade of Scrap Heap Challenge. I told you it wouldn't last. Make the noise, dude. I love these engines. I love engines. <laughs> 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 That's good. I mean, that thing's probably for stirring slurry. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>